Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, apes and ape bets. On behalf of Trey's Trades, the Gorilla Gang, and the AMC Investor Community, I would like to say I am not a dead cat. <laughs> and we would like to extend a warm welcome to Adam Aaron, the CEO of AMC Entertainment. Before we go any further, I wanted our community to know a little more about Adam, and I will spare you his illustrious resume. Adam graduated with a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard College and a Master of Business Administration from Harvard Business School. Adam has worked in various executive positions, including 20 years of experience as chief executive officer, 25 years of experience as corporate director, and 35 years of experience as a consumer engagement experience manager. With that being said, I would like to sincerely thank you, Adam, for accepting our interview request, helping us understand more about the upcoming shareholder meeting proposals, and discussing AMC's future with the Gorilla Gang. We're not sure if you're aware of this, but we consider you one of us and occasionally refer to you tenderly as the silverback of the Gorilla Gang. To our knowledge, never in the history of publicly traded companies has a CEO had total access to tens of thousands of global retail investors by way of a YouTube channel through one single influencer. And I have to say, I'm, I'm extremely humbled and honored to be able to be that, that guy speaking for the community. We view this as groundbreaking, and I'm sure that you, with your long history of consumer engagement experience, can appreciate that this has significant marketing and sentimental value to AMC and its shareholders. Adam, in case you were not aware of how widespread our community has grown, you know, you and me included, the entire community, there was a recent Reddit post with recent request for shareholders location. And amazingly, we found that we now have shareholding apes in 800 locations in 69 countries around the world. Before we begin, I would like to point out that we have reached out to our community and requested that apes suggest the subject matters and questions that we're going to be covering today <coughs> during this interview. So a lot of this is questions that have been asked by the public uh, specifically for you. And I just have to say one more time, it's an absolute honor to be able to speak with you. I'm very humbled. Well, Trey, uh, hello to you. Hello to your subscribers. Uh, you know what you said about this being groundbreaking. Uh, uh, my hat's off to you. Uh, uh, I'm well aware that you have been talking about AMC a lot over the last few months, and you have, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. You have uh, uh, tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of people watching your shows on on the YouTube channel here. And my whole career, I, I've been running companies now for a couple of decades, and uh, I've always thought it's very important for management teams and for chief executives to talk with their shareholders, to interact mm -hmm. with their shareholders. Um, and um, you're giving me that opportunity today, and I appreciate it. You know, I I, I said in a, I, I my 30 year old son actually forwarded to oh, me. Oh, that's awesome! <laughs> that, that your tweet that requested this interview, and. Um, uh, and I tweeted you right away and said that I would uh, be delighted to engage with you and uh, those who follow you. And I said something that's very important. And that is that the shareholders of our company are the owners of our company. Mm. And chief executives and boards of directors, you may not think of it this way, but we have a boss. And our boss, is the collection of our shareholders who own the company. So I actually work for you. Uh, and um, uh, for that reason, it's a special privilege to me to engage with all of you today. That means an absolute lot, Adam. It really does. And I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of comfort from that. You know, there's this, this misconception kind of that the, the executives or the people at the top of a company don't really care about the shareholders. So for, for a CEO to come out publicly, especially you, this is a, a large reason why I love AMC and I love talking about it, is it, it genuinely comes across like the, the management cares about the shareholders and increasing shareholder value. Well, Trey, Trey not, I, I'm sure there's a question coming, but I just, when you say that, I want to make a point. I... I'm an AMC show. Right. I own or have been granted and are waiting the best. I own a ton of AMC shares. Uh, last I checked, I owned 3.6 million shares or have been granted <laughs> shares right. that are waiting the best that I will become the owner of. I am a shareholder. Mm. Uh, you have no idea how much I care about the share price of AMC stock because a significant chunk of my net worth is tied up in AMC stock. And essentially all of my professional time 
is invested in AMC to improve the fortunes of our company with the goal of building shareholder value, which is something that I assume that your subscribers are gonna to like to hear. Remember, our interests are directly aligned. Right. You're a shareholder, I'm a shareholder. I only do well if shareholders do well. I think a lot of people forget uh, that. And, yeah, but it's, um, and actually, uh, that's the whole way this thing is structured. Um, uh, you know, it, look, it's no secret. CEOs get paid a lot of money in America to run large companies, but not as well understood. Five eighths of my annual compensation is an AMC stock. Right. If that AMC stock tanks, I do terribly. And, and by contrast, of course, if we can help drive up the value of the AMC share price over time, the right way, slowly, uh, uh, and by building value, by growing the company, by delivering earnings over the long haul. Uh, uh, if we can do all that, then I'll do very well. That's great to hear. That, that is a question. You, you've you got some great, uh, great 2020 vision anticipating some of the things we're going to talk about here today. And we're going to come back to that because I actually do have some things that I, I want to discuss, but it's it's very reassuring, you know, at least for me, you know, when when uh, I did some digging on some of the executives that own, you know, AMC stock, we, we sometimes forget there's this disconnect where we don't realize that we're all in this together. And I'm, I'm very familiar with the equity incentive plan that AMC Entertainment has for its executives, which I think is a, a great thing to really incentivize, you know, stock price to increase when I mean, you care about the shareholder value. You know, in fact, there are more than a hundred executives at AMC in the U S and Europe who are granted stock each year. And if we didn't grant that stock, we'd have to pay them more money in cash. Right. So there is, a, there's an advantage to the company of paying compensation in stock rather than paying compensation in cash, but it has a much bigger value than just saving the company some, some, uh, some cash. Uh, what this is doing, when we compensate our executive team in stock, mm. we're making sure that they're shareholders of the company. And also, most companies do this, but it's not talked about as much uh, in your community. We actually have a requirement that our executives must hold a certain amount of stock. Really? I didn't know that. And I, and I forget what the number is for me. It's either three times my salary or four times my salary or five times my salary. Fascinating. It's a big number. Now, I'm way over that. Right. Uh, and in fact, not only have I been granted AMC stock, uh, I think on three separate occasions, I went into the market and bought AMC stock just because I thought it was a good value at the time. One of us. But what? But I am one of you. But what this does with all the executives who are granted stock, and are required to, to hold some of that stock, uh, it means we force them to act and think like shareholders. Why? Because they are shareholders. Uh, and of course, the best thing we can do as a company is to incentivize our management team uh, to uh, want the share price to rise. And I, I keep on saying, Rise responsibly, rise over time, rise the right way, no game playing, uh, uh, grow the earnings, grow the stature of our company, uh, capitalize on opportunities, uh, rise to the challenge of any, any problems. And, and that's really, and you know, when we talk about a hundred different people in the organization um, who are granted stock each year, this isn't just fat cats. This isn't just like, three people at the top or five people at the top or eight people at the top. This is a hundred people deep. And this is people uh, uh, all across the United States and in Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. And we want them thinking like shareholders so that their every waking decision is what's in the best interest of an AMC shareholder. hundred percent. That's, that's, you know, the, the, the equity incentive plan, you know, it, it's exactly as you said. It, it incentivizes the people who, who work for the company to to care about increasing value so that you're not just going to work to go to work. You're going to work because you take pride in, in the stuff that you hold. And I think this is a great segue into kind of my first question that I have for the day. Um, you know, talking about that that growth over time, uh, being able to slowly 
generate revenue and, and continue to push a company forward. Now, <laughs> with that being said, you, you obviously have previous experience. We've talked about, you know, part of your resume, but I think it'd be important in a wasted opportunity not to talk about, you know, some of the previous jobs that you've held. So do, do you think you could tell us about one of the companies that you have worked for and, you know, some, some of the business adversities you had to overcome, the successes that it brought to the company that couldn't have happened without you? Sure. You know, I think a career is a, is a building block. Uh, and you're walking down a path and everything you do now is a result of the experience that you gather along the way. Um, and, um, you know, uh, so I was the chief marketing officer of Hyatt Hotels back mm. in the 1980s. That's a long time ago. I wasn't alive yet. And, <laughs> and they know that you, your parents might not even. No, be they were now. around, but not for, not for long. Probably in elementary school. So I was an expert in loyalty marketing because I was one of the creators of airline frequent flyer programs, which is a, when I, I, I helped invent them when I was 28 years old. That was a good thing to help invent when you were 28 years old. That's awesome. And a few years later, I joined Hyatt as the chief marketing officer. Hyatt did not have a loyalty program at all. Mm. And Marriott, who was Hyatt's biggest competitor at the time, did. And Hyatt was getting his clock clean. And so I quickly created a program called Hyatt Gold Passport, which was a strong player in the frequent guest program arena. I was CMO of United Airlines, uh, but that led to my being given my first CEO job when I was 38 years old at Norwegian Cruise Line uh, in 1993. And Norwegian Cruise Line was in real trouble. It had very little cash, it had a lot of debt, it had a bad product and a weak competitive position in the industry. Um, when I took that job, the CEO of Carnival Corporation, Carnival Cruise Lines, right. actually made a public speech and said that he thought that Norwegian Cruise Line would be forced to file for Chapter 11 within 90 days. Mm. And this was my first CEO job. And I thought, my, welcome to the major leagues. They throw the fastball really hard <laughs> and push your head in the major leagues. Because here I've been CEO for like two weeks. And my biggest competitor is already predicting that we're going to collapse. Well, it was a it was a tough tough challenge, but I am very proud to say that we did a complete and masterful turnaround at Norwegian Cruise Line. And not only did we not file for Chapter Eleven, we improved our our, our fleet of ships. We improved our product at sea. We improved our marketing. We improved our financial strength. And fast forward, I'm still on the board of directors of Norwegian Cruise yeah. Line to this day. It's the only other public company that I'm a director of at the moment. Uh, and prior to the pandemic, Norwegian was still the third largest cruise company in the world with a $12 billion market cap. That would not have been the case had we not saved a, uh, Norwegian back in the uh, mid-1990s. Mm. And of course, the relevance of that experience to AMC is Very quite obvious. obvious. Right. Uh, I certainly did not anticipate in December of 19, uh, 2019 that uh, the strongest movie theater company in the world, mm. the biggest movie theater company in the world, the most successful movie theater in the company in the world, the most profitable movie theater company in the world would be on death's door in 90 days because the world would literally stop. Who of us thought that we would be locked in our homes and apartments for almost a year. Right. Uh, uh, and, but that's what happened. We went from having uh, $480 million a month of revenue to $0 a month of revenue mm. overnight, like literally overnight. And when I say literally overnight, you know, people miss something. Oh, he means, you know, over 12 months or 20 months. shut down all at once. I mean, overnight. Right. Yeah. We had, to, we had to shut a thousand theaters in the span of a week. And our revenues disappeared. And that put AMC in quite a precarious position. Mm. We, we're a high fixed cost, low variable cost business. So even though we shed a lot of expenses to try to cope with a pandemic, we were still burning through a ton of cash. Uh, and there were five separate occasions between April of 2020 and January of 2021 
where AMC was within six to 12 weeks of running out of money. Mm. But go back to that, those Norwegian, Norwegian cruise, cruise line, line right? days. I was used to staring death in the face and beating it. And um, we raised a lot of money between April of 2020 and uh, January 21. Uh, we raised about $2.8 billion of debt and equity. And we also had a lot of friends because, you know, this is a hundred year old company. We picked up a lot of friends along the way. And then we had a lot of allies. And there were so many constituencies who were rooting for AMC to succeed. Take our theater landlords. You know that our theater landlords deferred $450 million of contractually owed rent for 2020. Mm. Uh, and they have been working with us hand in glove to help us to survive this crisis. Our lenders, who we owe a lot of money to, uh, again, our first lien holders, our second lien holders, they were with us in one of our very sophisticated complex refinancings last July. We literally, with a stroke of a pen, wiped away $555 million of debt. It just disappeared. It just went away. Why? Because we knew what we were doing. Moles and company, our investment bankers, and Citibank, and Goldman Sachs and B. Riley, our investment bankers, they knew what they were doing. Um, and we all, we all rallied around this company. And we were just going to be damned if AMC was going to fail, which sort of takes me to your retail investors. Mm. Um, this is another audience that has really rallied around AMC over the past year. Um, and I know, sure, there are some people who are in it only for a buck and are only, or, or 10 bucks is the case. Yeah, maybe. right. Uh, and are just looking at the share price and hoping it will rise and, and they'll make money from that. But I also know for a fact that a lot of our retail investors rallied around AMC, not only because they hoped it would be a profitable investment, but because they actually have an affection and an allegiance to our company. 100% sentimental value. And, and they want to see AMC thrive and survive. They don't want to see enemies of AMC put us under and run us out. Uh, and I certainly share, I share that view. Going back to my experience, so I just want to mention one other thing because it's so unusual, but also relevant to the challenge at AMC. Um, I've been a very casual sports fan my whole life. Right. In 2011, one of my closest friends bought the NBA team in my hometown. I grew up in Philadelphia, just a middle-class kid. I went to a big public high school with 975 kids in my graduating class. Two of us out of, you said I went to Harvard College. Two of us out of 975 got into Harvard. Two out of 975. Wow. So I've been, defi I've been defying gravity for a long time. But one of my close friends bought the NBA team in my hometown. And there were like a dozen people in his ownership group. And he not only invited me to join the ownership group of the 76ers, he, he asked me to chuck everything else I was doing professionally and go move back to Philadelphia and take over the Sixers as CEO of my hometown team. And I got to tell you, I, I've done more substantial things in my life, but I've never done anything more fun than running an NBA team in my hometown. And, uh, but it was business, too, because when, Philadelphia is the fifth largest city in the United States. Mm. But the 76ers, uh, who in my youth were very you know, popular, whether it was Will Chamberlain or Dr. J or Allen Iverson, I mean, this was, this was a great story franchise in, in the NBA. Third most playoff appearances of all NBA teams, only a, a, along with the Lakers and the Celtics. And, um, and yet... Philadelphia had turned off on the Sixers. And by 2011, when our ownership group came in, uh, we were only filling half of our, our arena. And we were only selling 10,000 tickets a game mm. in a 21,000-seat stadium. Right. And for the fifth largest city in the country to have an NBA team with a 27th best attendance in a 30-team league, that's pretty bad. Yeah. But uh, – you may recall, I've pretty, been, pretty much been a sales and marketing expert my whole career. Well, guess what? 
we we applied those skills at the in Philadelphia to the, to the Sixers and the 70, 76ers. Uh, we started selling out almost immediately, and by our fifteenth game in the two thousand eleven two thousand twelve season, we were selling out our building again, and we actually had the biggest attendance increase of all 30 teams in the NBA that year. Uh, and I think those sales and marketing skills that I've had all along the way, including what I put in place in Philadelphia, go Sixers, go. Um, uh, the, those skills are also going to be very important for AMC because what this pandemic has done is we had a very loyal customer base. AMC in the United States sold 250 million tickets Mm. More than 250 million tickets in 2019. But because of this pandemic, those people have been sitting on the sidelines. And our job at AMC, my job as chief executive at AMC, is to get those people to come back to our theaters. And all those marketing skills and all those sales skills and all those consumer engagement skills, they are all going to be put to the test over the next eight months uh, as we rebuild our business and bring it back. And I'm so glad that uh, that you're able to discuss all this stuff. I mean, it's I think a lot of people don't realize that you, you kind of the, the the comeback kid in a way. I mean, you've you've come out of some great adversity with with companies that you've worked with. You know, specifically Norwegian Cruise Line. And I got to be honest, I didn't even know about the you know the 76ers attendance. I mean, and that really directly applies to AMC, which should you know bring a lot of. Uh, I'd say comfort to shareholders, especially with the way that the media, sadly, <coughs> plays off that this is just a bankruptcy-ridden company that's dumb money, at, you know, quote, un- end quote, for an investor to, to get into. So that's really, really awesome to hear. That's good. Well, so here's the thing. Uh, always be careful about conventional wisdom because people sign on to conventional wisdom really fast. It doesn't mean they're right. Hmm. And... There were a lot of so-called experts who were absolutely convinced that AMC was going to die because of this pandemic. And look, I understand why they had concerns. I've already said five different times we were close to running out of money. Right. But here's the thing. You shouldn't underestimate a company's resolve. You shouldn't underestimate the power of a CEO to lead. You shouldn't underestimate all the allies and friends that companies pick up over time. And uh, I said to my board of directors, this is a direct quote, um, back in, it was April or May, we were having a board meeting, we were talking about our situation. And I said, you know, the first company I ran when I was 38 years old, uh, everybody said it was going to go bankrupt. I didn't let that happen. Right. And uh, I'm now 66 and a half. And I expect to be running AMC for a long time. I've already run AMC for uh, five years and four months. And I'm sure I'm going to, I can't say I'm sure, you know. You never know. never know what's going to happen in life. But I'd sure love to run AMC for another five years and four months more. Maybe another 10 years and eight months more. But my plan is to be here. And... um, so I said to my board, and you know, look, and if I'm here for 10 more years, I'll be 75. I mean, at some point you do hang it up. Right. But, but I, I got a lot of energy for a 66-year-old cat, let me tell you. And um, I said to my board, I didn't let the first company I ran go into bankruptcy, and I'll be damned if I'm going to let the last company I run go into mm-hmm. bankruptcy. And sure enough, we just, we, for us to pull it off, we needed to do everything flawlessly. But that's when you feel good about the experience that you have and the right. drive that you have You've done and it the smarts that you have. And uh, I'm so proud of the management team of AMC. We did really execute so well post-pandemic. Uh, so we proved all those experts wrong. But as those experts talked us down and talked us down and talked us down, by January 5, I believe was the date, they'd gotten our share price down to $1.91. Uh, and they were still saying, uh, it's going down more. And we just uh, would not let that happen. We laid out our plan publicly. 
And we said in late December of 2020 that we were gonna try to raise $750 million to make sure that we could uh, have the financial runway to get to the other side of this pandemic. And remember, we didn't cause this pandemic. It's not, it wasn't the mismanagement of AMC executives right, that caused right. the company to be in trouble, it's that the world stopped. And, and sure enough, not only did we raise $750 million, when people predicted, I can show you article after article after article that was written in January that said, they're not gonna raise the money. Well, on January 25, we announced that we had raised $917 million. And on Wednesday, January 27, we said, actually, we raised another $305 million between Monday and Wednesday. Mm. So it got up to a billion two twenty-two. And between Wednesday and Friday of that same week, we raised another $600 million. So we raised $1.822 billion between December 14 uh, and uh, uh, January 29, I guess it would have been. Uh, and as we sat there at the end of February, we had more than $1.1 billion in the bank. And we have every confidence that with any kind of semblance of recovery of the movie industry and the movie theater industry, and with all these vaccinations out there, um, you, and, and, and people being so sick and tired of being cooped Locked up, up yeah. at home, uh, it feels like movies are going to get released again. We just had Godzilla Kong. Uh, you're well aware that I, I think you're well aware. I'm very well aware. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, our attendance for the five first five days of Godzilla, uh, Kong versus Godzilla, um, was quintuple, five times hmm. what our business had been the Wednesday to Sunday before and the Wednesday to Sunday before that and the Wednesday to Sunday before that. So, uh, you just feel like the business is going to come back with any kind of semblance of recovery of our industry. This money that we raised is enough to get us through, to get to the other side. Uh, but even now, we're sort of planning, uh, if we need more money, what do we do? Because the worst thing that I could possibly do is let the company share price slide back down to $1.91. Right. As uh, people come out and again try to uh, doom tell and naysay the future prospects of AMC, like you're well aware, there's one analyst who put out a report says our share price is going to a, a penny. penny. Yeah, right. There's another analyst who said our share price is going to a dollar. There's another analyst who said who says the share price is going to two dollars. Personally, I like the report that came out from an analyst about two weeks ago saying our share price is going to rise to thirteen dollars. What's going to happen? Nobody really knows what's going to happen. It depends on the pace of recovery mm. and a whole host of other factors. Uh, but we're already putting contingency plans uh, into place so that if we need to raise more cash, we can raise more cash. Um, and I'm not talking now about the 500 million share issue. Right, which we'll get into I'm here in a while. About, I'm sure. I'm only talking about the fact that we have 63 million shares that have already been authorized by the board years ago in 2013. Mm. That was eight years ago. Uh, uh, we already know that if we needed to raise more equity, uh, we could because we have um, essentially, it says 63 million shares are available, but it's really only 43 million shares are available because we have to allocate 20 million of the 63 million to the compensation grants for the next several years. Right. Um, but we have 43 million shares at our disposal that we could uh, use to raise liquidity if we need it. Um, again, I'm just telling you what the management of your company, because you're a shoulder, I know. Uh, Very I don't know how many shares you I don't even know how many shares you own because you tweeted yeah. it a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> That's good. Uh, uh, but um, uh, we're putting contingency plans in place just to make sure that we can survive this pandemic. The pandemic's not over yet. It's in the process of being over. But we're not out of the woods totally yet. Mm. But 
I have every confidence we'll get there. And, um, but we're also putting in, uh, we're also proposing other ideas, which we think can greatly advance the company. I'm tired of playing defense. We've been playing defense since March of 2020 against this pandemic. I want to play offense. Shorters. I want to play against short sellers. I want to, I want to play offense again. You know, I, I told you a minute ago that we turned AMC from being the second largest movie theater company in the United States to the largest movie theater company in the world. Mm. Uh, we, we were going to the pandemic the most profitable movie theater company on the planet. Right. Uh, and I do believe that very bright days are ahead for AMC. I'm not in this for a week or a month or a year. Uh, I've been in this for five and a half years already. I intend to be in this for another five and a half or 10 and a half years going forward. And my job and the job of the whole executive team of AMC is to build shareholder value. Mm. And we have a lot of ideas how we can do that. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to talk about some of them uh, later in, in this interview. Definitely. So I, I feel very good. It's, it's good to have this confidence to talk about the things that, you know, we, we, uh, we have working for us with AMC. We've got great experience. We've got uh, incentivized, you know, executives that work for the company. We've got, you know, a, a great prospect coming up as long as COVID and quarantine work out the way that we anticipate they do. But I kind of want to address some of the concerns that people have, you know, just for clarity, because to be frank, Anytime that you you end up on the news, they twist it. It ends up you see. I, I'm sure that you saw when uh, you know all these brokerage firms sent out the 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 <coughs> the, the, the fud, fear, and certainty, and doubt about the 500 million share dilution, which we'll get into in a little bit. But I, I wanted to start off here talking about Wanda and talking about insider selling. Now I want to talk about Wanda because they're a major AMC shareholder. Um, our community has reviewed you know recent SEC documents, you know, indicating that they sold approximately 15 million shares, hold about 30 million shares as it sits right now, and that there have been insiders that you know between. January and March have sold part of their positions in AMC. And this is, uh, you know, coming from my perspective, I'm 23 years old, I'm a young <coughs> investor, but typically when insiders sell a stake in AMC, whether it be, you know, Wanda or executives working within the company, that can be a red flag, you know? Um, would you mind just kind of talking about that a little bit, giving some reassurance, maybe an explanation as to what's going on there, um, how your relationship with Wanda still is now as a company, um, just to give clarification, because there's a lot of uncertainty regarding the, the selling that's possibly happened. Sure, let's talk about them as, as separate issues. Let me talk about Wanda first. Definitely. So Wanda has been uh, a really wonderful shareholder of AMC. Really wonderful shareholder. They bought the company and uh, control the company, not all the company, but control the company in 2012. Uh, actually, I guess they bought all the company and they took part of the company public. Right. So briefly, they own all of it. Um, uh, but when you actually get into what was going on at Wanda, in 2017, that's four years ago, right. the Chinese government made a major change in policy and strategy. Uh, in 2012, the, the previous time that the Chinese government had made a big pronouncement, they encouraged Chinese companies, and Wanda is one of the largest companies in China. Right. Private company, not government owned, private company, um, uh, uh, to invest internationally. Mm. And Wanda and many other China, major Chinese companies started buying things in Europe and the United States and Asia. Uh, and, and that was strongly encouraged by the government. In 2017, the Chinese government made a major change in strategy. Uh, they started to see that the Chinese domestic economy was slowing. And so the change that they, a big pronouncement, was that Chinese companies, instead of investing internationally, should invest in the Chinese domestic economy instead. That's caused a lot of Chinese companies to start to disengage internationally mm. and to take their investment dollars back home. And one is no exception. So in 2018, they sold some stock. Right. And again, in 2021, they sold some stock. Uh, but that's, um, I, I personally believe, and I don't sit in the Wanda boardroom. I right. Yeah, right, right. So, 
I, I, I can't speculate for Wanda, but my take on it is that has a lot less to do with AMC as a company. Their, their confidence in AMC or their view of the future of AMC uh, and much more to do with the fact that they, they needed and wanted to bring dollars back to their domestic economy. And they did it in 2018 and they did it again in 2021. Um, so just, I'm as, just thinking about this right off the top as, of my head. I, 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 but a, before we leave Wanda, we, they are the largest movie theater chain in China. Right. And, and China is the second largest movie market country on the planet. And uh, they still own 30 million AMC shares. Mm. And we still have the closest of relations. And I expect that no matter what the ownership situation is of Wanda in AMC, we'll still maintain very tight relations because it's good for us as we deal with studios. You know, we're the largest exhibitor in Europe. We're the largest exhibitor in the United States. Our sister company is the largest exhibitor in China. And that's good. And I expect it will be in a, you know, a friendly Wanda orbit for a long time. I think the important thing about Wanda selling down shares is not whether they bought or they sold. It's that the fact that they did it in such an orderly fashion. Mm. When they sold shares in 2018, our share price increased. Normally, if you think a big insider is selling the share yeah, price, it goes down. Our, our share price went up because Wanda intelligently sold shares in an orderly fashion in 2018. They didn't sell another share again for two and a half years. And when they sold stock again, again, the share price was rising. <laughs> they did it in an orderly fashion that did not hurt other shareholders. And that's my opinion. It's no one, it's, life's too complicated to totally understand uh, how stocks trade and why stocks trade and what influence is causing what. Uh, but in my view, uh, Wanda has been a very responsible shareholder. And if they've had to sell down, they've done it in a way that does not hurt their fellow AMC shareholders. That's awesome. I was actually going to ask about that. That was my, my question was if, you know, when they did sell off, people were speculating that it affected the stock price. It could have tanked it. And then, you know, a, a second part to that would have been down the road, considering that it's not really so much they're selling because of AMC as a company, but more so their relations within China. Um, is it possible that we see them pull out more from those 30 million shares? Do you anticipate that they will be good business partners down the road? Is that, I, personally, just from what I'm hearing, it doesn't seem like something to be concerned with, but um, yeah, let me know. A, I don't know what they're going to do with their 30 million shares. Right. B, I do expect they will be good business partners for the long haul, no matter what they do with their 30 million shares. But you're focusing on the wrong issue when you look at this recent uh, share price decline, because that occurred after Wanda sold, right. not, be not before. That's what I thought. Uh, and the, on, the, on the favorite subject of your not the favorite subject, a favorite subject of your subscribers. Uh, the new short sale report just came out. Right. And on March 15-ish, we had 49 million short shares. On March 30, we had 73 million short shares. Mm. So that means that our short share count increased by 50% almost between March 15 and March 30. Uh, I think our company is under attack again. Uh, Without a doubt. And, um, and I think that's why um, we're seeing what we're seeing. It may have to do with other factors too. Um, uh, some more movie titles have been pushed back a little bit. Top Gun Maverick got pushed from 4th of July weekend to November 19 before Thanksgiving. There's no real way to know exactly what's right. causing the movement in a share price. But here's what I do know. Uh, I believe that AMC has survived this pandemic and will survive this pandemic. I believe that we have the tools in our toolkit to keep, the, keep AMC going strong. Now, there are a whole bunch of risks. And there's something in official SEC land called a forward-looking statement. And we have a whole bunch of disclosures that we put out in our various printed filings and our press releases that people should ignore any forward-looking statement 
and that they should carefully read our prospectuses and our filings. And I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to say anything that I say about the future, you all take with a grain of salt because maybe I'm wrong. Right. And, or maybe I don't have a crystal ball or maybe my crystal ball is a little off color. <laughs> but given that there are a whole set of risks and uncertainties that surround AMC, and they are there, there is no doubt about that, and we've disclosed what they are. If you go to our SEC filings, uh, I encourage you to, to look at them and to read them carefully. Having said that, long-term, Adam Aaron is a bull. I own a lot of AMC stock. I'm investing all my professional time to try to drive this business forward. And as I said earlier, there are strategies we have that are very good for AMC to come out of this pandemic, to rebuild our company, Rebuild, we have to do because we sold 250 million tickets in the US, 100 million tickets in Europe, the Middle East we did, in 2019. We didn't do that in 2020. Mm. We're not going to do that in 2021. But boy, would I like to get there in 2022 or 2023 or 2024. I, and, but not only get back to where we were, I'd like to keep going. And I'd like to grow this company even more so. That's uh that's good things to hear. Uh, it's it's fascinating because you said that I think people are focused on all the wrong things. They're worried about Wanda, you know, affecting the the share prices or or the insiders, you know. And you can address that if you'd like to, um, you know, affecting the share prices. But um, it's it's the inner clockings of the of the mechanism of the stock market, right? It's um, more than just that. Like we don't live in a vacuum where one specific event is going to cause the entire, you know, downtrend of a stock. I mean, as we just talked about, the short reports came out and I pay for some data, you know, to keep up to date with the, the short interest, which continuously increases every single day. The, the company 100% is on a, on, a, on attack. It's being attacked by, by hedge funds and shorters. And I think that's to blame more so than, you know, Wanda taking out a stake of the stock or, you know, insiders, which I'd actually like to hear your opinion on if, you, if you're able to talk about that, why that may be, you know, happening. If it just, you know, because I know about the equity incentive plan, you know, maybe it's just that they, they liquidated some shares to you know pay their mortgages or feed their families or whatever it might be. But uh, feel free to speak on that if you'd like to. Well, uh, are you thinking about the fact that some, some executive sold? Right. Uh, look, these people are human beings. And uh, their stock, they, look, they've been living under attack for a year. Uh, and they saw the stock, you know, uh, quadruple, quintuple, sextuple. Like it's right. only human nature to take some of the chips off the table. I'll tell you this. I haven't sold any stock. Uh, I know that. And I haven't sold, it. I haven't sold any stock uh, in the five and a half years I've been here. All I've been doing is adding stock with one caveat, because I believe in full transparency and full disclosure. My two, I've got twin boys. They turned 30 years of age this year. Uh, I'm 66 and a half years old. For estate planning purposes, purposes, I did gift, um, uh, uh, I think, just under uh, uh, 250,000 shares. Is that what it was? Yeah, I was going to do the percentage. But I think I gifted 6% of my AMC stock to each of my two adult sons for them to do with what they wish without my fatherly interference. They're 30 years of age right. now. Um, but other than that, uh, I have not sold a single share, uh, and I don't intend to sell any shares anytime soon. I am a believer in, in this company. I am as well. I, I think, you know, the majority, especially the retail investor, which I think makes up as of now, 85% of the total, uh, you know, float available to the public, which is incredible. Uh, it just shows you how much we're invested in the community. Uh, we've all been holding, you know, through the ups and downs, the emotional roller coaster that has been, uh, you know, AMC's company over the last couple of months. Um, and I, I think you've got a really loyal, you know, investor core, which is awesome to see. It's great to be a part of. I kind of wanted to tie into, and we, and we, oh, have, and we have, and we have, and we appreciate that you are there. Oh, we, we, we love it. You know, it's a, it's a great community and I gotta be honest, you know, my, my personal, I'm, I'm very happy and grateful because the, the business that I've built for myself was, was created off of a community of awesome people. Like, and, and I have to be so grateful for the people that have brought me because of that. The team that I've got, the, the friends that I've made, uh, it's, it's a lot deeper. That's where the sentimental value where we talked about comes into play, where people really feel attached to the people who invest in this company and the company itself. And it's, it's, it's great to see. 
hey, go back to where I was trained. You know, I got my MBA at Harvard. You know what they taught me back then? What's that? They said companies are owned by their shareholders and companies are supposed to do what's in the best interest of their shareholders. Right. Uh, And that community that you described is our shareholder base. Mm. They are the owners of our company, which is why I'm talking to you today. Uh, I'd like to engage with our shareholders and this, this is a platform for me to do that. Just that. Awesome. It's an absolute honor. Once again, I really do appreciate that. So I, I think the the biggest piece that we probably want to dissect here is, you know, proposal one of the recent proxy statement, the 500 million share dilution. I've paid very close attention to this. I've been covering it, as you know, on the channel for a lo- quite a while now, trying to dig through everything that's going on. And, you know, we've, we've come up with a couple of questions, <laughs> but the, the main thing is the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. There's a lot of unknowns regarding the 500 million share dilution, the proposal for it. And the media is not helping in the least bit. It spreads a massive amount of fear, and that scares a lot of the retail investors. So I want to take the opportunity. Well, this is just my first question. We can kind of go from here and have a conversation. But, um, you know, we know that the board of directors is urging that we vote yes to proposal one at the annual meeting of stockholders on May 4th. And it's it's a critical requirement, right? It was in quotations as I take that directly from proposal one in the proxy statement. So, you know, this would increase the total number of shares by 500 million shares. If we were to hypothetically put them all into the market, which I don't personally believe will happen. Uh, I don't, I think there's some fear that will happen to a total of over 1 billion shares. So what are the possible benefits to your shareholders of doubling the number of authorized shares out on the market? You know, it's important for people to realize that this is <coughs> the, the right, not the obligation to issue stock. So I want to, that's, that's my first question. I'll let you take the reins and, you know, kind of talk about it. So uh, you talk about fear, uncertainty, and doubt. There's more misinformation floating around the internet, floating around the media, about this proposal to increase the authorization by 500 million shares. Uh, So I might go in a bit of a filibuster here, not because I want a filibuster, but because you give me a perfect opportunity to explain what's going on. I also intend to make one brand new announcement right now uh, that is unknown to anyone heretofore. And we, because, and it's it's big news, so we're actually gonna have to file this publicly uh, today, uh, after your, uh, uh, after this tape session airs, uh, first of all, there's confusion about what this share authorization means. Some people incorrectly think that that means that we will massively dilute the stock. Uh, we did this as a company once before. 2013, right? In 2013, the board authorized approximately 500 million shares. The exact number doesn't matter. The first time that any of those shares were used was the end of 2016 hmm. and early 2017 when we used approximately. 32 million shares out of the 500 million, approximately 500 million, right. to acquire, help us finance the acquisition of Odeon and Nordic and Carmack, which turned AMC into the largest movie theater circuit in the world. And do you know what happened to our share price back then? I went back and I looked. I fact checked it too. Yeah. Our share price in early six, 2016 was around $17 a share. We issued 32 million new shares. Remember, half a billion have been authorized, but but they hadn't been used. Right. But 33 years later, 32 million were used. Our share price almost doubled. Now, if you thought, well, dilution is bad, then you were wrong because Foolish dilution is bad. Smart dilution is smart. Mm. And uh, our share price went up to like $32, $33, $34 on the strength of the Carmike, Odeon, and Nordic acquisitions, which we could not have done if we did not have those 32 million shares sitting in our pocket. Do you know the next time we used any of those shares? 2020, right? 
September, the last days of September of 2020, another three and a half years later. Uh, and we put about, I want to say, uh, 300 million shares in the market. Had we not had the ability to put those 300 million shares in the market, our company would have collapsed financially and the share price would have gone to zero. Mm. And of those 300 million shares, 250 million of those 300 million shares went out between December 14 and January 27, six, actually six. And again, if your theory is dilution is just bad, then if we put 250 million shares out in the market in the span of two months, I guess our share price should have fallen. What happened to our share price? Prior to the Reddit rally, the so-called Reddit rally, our share price tripled. Right. Because, yes, we diluted the stock, but we did it smartly for a good cause, which was to save the company. We did it at the right time. We did it at the right price. And it actually caused our share price to soar. It tripled <laughs> between uh, early January uh, and late January because we raised the money, which was considered to be a very positive development for MC. Now that takes, so there's, there's a history there that we've authorized shares, but we didn't use them for years. And we only used them when it was smart to do so and when we needed to do so. Mm. And in both cases, we increased shareholder value as a result. Now, as we sit here today, from the old authorization, from back in the 2013 authorization, we have 43 million shares that we could use to raise capital, to raise cash, if we needed to do so. Uh, and at the current share price, you know, that could bring in another 300, 400 million dollars. Less of the share price went down, more of the share price went up. Uh, we think that's probably all we need to get through the pandemic. So why are we asking for another authorization for 500 million additional shares? Right. The answer is because companies don't do this with a five week or a five month time frame. They do it with a five year time frame. They do it with a seven year time frame. They do it with a 10 year time frame. Uh, uh, when these 43 million shares are exhausted, we will have none left and we lose uh, an arrow in our quiver. We lose a tool in our toolkit. We will no longer have the optionality and the flexibility to be able to issue shares if issuing shares is in the best interest of shareholders. Mm. And so looking ahead for the next five to 10 years, we've authorized this, we've asked the shareholders to authorize more shares. That doesn't mean that we will issue them. Right. Remember, the last time we did this, we didn't issue any shares for three and a half years. We didn't issue any shares after that for three and a half years more. Uh, but, and that's what's going on here. We're not asking the shareholders to authorize these shares so we can flood the market with them. That would be crazy mm. and foolish. And there are two things that I know that we're not. We're not crazy and we're not fools. So I told you I was going to make some news. Uh, here we go. Very excited for this. Uh, we are going to pledge right now today publicly, and we will file this publicly, so it will be binding on us because you can't announce intentions and then not, not carry through. We hereby pledge at AMC that if the shareholders approve this authorization for 500 million new shares to be issued, we will not use one of those 500 million shares in calendar year 2021. That's huge news. Not one of them. Wow. People, because that, that's, that's been the big concern. 
Adam, that's been the hugest concern with this is uh, you, you can't be a stranger to the short squeeze phenomenon. It's, it was addressed in some filings and people were really nervous about it. They were like, what happens if this kills all the momentum of the potential to essentially bleed short positions because it's no, you know, you know that hedge funds are short on the stock and wow. Holy cow. I got my heart beating. I can't. Well, what, 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 what I don't want to do is I don't want to get too in the far. In the right. No, no, I'm not, I'm not asking that. Of you. I know you're not, but, I, but I'm still going to kind of act like a real CEO and not talk about right. it. Right. But I got you. Uh, but what I do know is uh, if we need to raise some cash in the short term, Remember, we already have 43 million shares that are out there that were authorized in the year 2013 Right. that we could use if we wish to to raise some cash if we decide that's a good idea. We have made no decisions yet. We're thinking about it, but we haven't made decisions yet. But I'm just here by pledging, we will not use a single one of these 500 million additional shares in calendar 2021. I've read some of the stuff that's coming out of... Uh, uh, the, the voices of retail investors. And they're saying things like, yeah, we get it. The 500 million share authorization might be good for the company for the long term, but we're really much more concerned what's going to happen the next month or two or three. Well, I can take that whole issue off the table because <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, AMC will not use any of these 500 million new shares in calendar 21, just will not do it. And that's not only a pledge that I'm making on trace trades, um, or as your backwards Twitter yeah. handle, Twitter, <laughs> Twitter handle trades trade is very confusing, by the way. I know. Um, uh, but that's not just a pleasure we're making here. We're going to make that publicly, also today. Um, uh, but remember, we're asking for these shares because we believe that if shareholders give us as a management team, who I think you basically trust, we've proven to be pretty adept so far. Right. Uh, if you give us the flexibility to use those shareholders, those shares, when it makes sense for you, the shareholder, that's when we'll use them, uh, and not before. And let me tell you. And remember, the last time we did this, we didn't use shares for three and a half years. Right. We didn't use shares for three and a half years again after that. Uh, but let me give you You still there, Adam? And we could use stock as a currency. Well, that could be very attractive. What happened you know, we trade in the open market of multiple we traded from anywhere from seven to 13 times our EBITDA on the public markets. Mm. What happens if we could buy another company at four or five times EBITDA? Well, if you can buy a company at four or five times EBITDA and trade at seven or nine or 10 or 12 times EBITDA, the arbitrage of that, you make money like on day one plus because we already exist and we already have a big overhead we could probably absorb another movie theater circuit and get rid of their overhead and use our existing overhead. So we be even more efficient and drive even more EBITDA, more earnings right. out of an acquired movie theater circuit. But the only way I'm going to pull that off in the short term with this pandemic hanging around our head is if I have stock to do so. If the shareholders don't give us the authorization to use stock in that way, then wave goodbye to the acquisition opportunities where we can make kind of instant money for our shareholders, create instant value for our shareholders just on the strength of an acquisition. So that's one example. Another example, we have hundreds of millions of dollars of public debt today trading at a substantial discount to the face value of that debt. Hmm. We have a couple of billion dollars of debt trading at a small discount to their face value today. Um, what if we could use stock to buy back some of that debt at a discount? Uh, 
I'm not predicting that we can. I'm not predicting that we will. But what I am saying is if the shareholders make this vote in the affirmative, then at least we'll have the flexibility and optionality to think about it. And if we could pull it off, that would create instant value for our shareholders. The value of buying back the debt at a, at a minor or major discount would be, would, it would be accretive. It would be far more valuable to the shareholder than the dilution that would accompany it. And we're not doing this in a vacuum. We have some of the smartest financial advisors in the United States who are telling us when we should do some things and when we shouldn't do things. But even if you could buy it back at a big discount, if you don't have the resources to do it, it doesn't matter. Right. And so, again, this goes back to playing offense, not playing defense. I'd love to be able to buy some debt back at a discount, but I, it would be unwise to use our precious cash to do it because none of us know the pace of what this recovery will be. Uh, and, um, uh, and so we need to husband our cash. We need to be very conservative with our cash. But, if, but stock is a legitimate currency. Now, if we misuse that currency, again, if we do something that, um, uh, I guess what you're, the, 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 the basic FUD these days is that we would flood the market. Right, yeah. Or alternatively, there are some people who just think that the mere authorization of the shares is actually issuing the shares, which of course it isn't. Right. Um, but as I said, we're not going to do that because we are shareholders also. Uh, and uh, uh, so I want this optionality. I want this flexibility so that if, if it's wise to do something, if we can create value for our shareholders by doing something, we have the opportunity and the capability to do it. I'm going to give you a third example. We have um, the public number that we disclosed as of December 31 is we owe $450 million of back rent from 2020 mm -hmm. that's payable over uh, several years. Some cases only a year, some cases it's like years and years and years and years. I think it averages out over a couple of years. Well, uh, our landlords have been very good to us in the past year. They like AMC. They're rooting for AMC. Hard not to, They yeah. supported AMC. They helped keep AMC in business. They helped keep us in business. Uh, and just like some of your retail investors believe in our stock, a lot of our landlords believe in our stock too. Mm. So what happens if we could say to our landlords, not all of them, some of them, not 500 million shares worth, but some number of shares. Right. What if we... We owe you X million dollars of rent, Mr. Landlord. Uh, how about we give you stock now instead of cash over the next, you know, pick at a random 24 months. Right. Um, but in exchange for us giving you stock now instead of cash over 24 or 36 months, how about you give us a break? And how about you give us a big discount on what we owe you? Uh, again, if we could do that, if we could use stock as a currency, theoretically, because the, the landlord might think the stock would rise in value, right, and right. it would be in his interest or her interest to do so. Um, if we could get some of our uh, theater rents that we owe, either looking backwards or looking forwards, you know, what about if we could just say to landlords, hey, you know, right now we pay you X dollars a square foot. That's our lease. What we like to do is give you Y dollars a square foot and some stock, such that the Y dollars in the stock is less than the X dollars. Like, if uh, again, I'm not predicting we can pull this off. I'm not predicting we uh, uh, really will even think about it hard, but we might. And it just it's another example of the kind of flexibility it creates for a management team when the shareholders arm us with this capability to use a resource for mm -hmm. shareholders' own benefit. And then I'm gonna give you another example. 
Uh, as I said, I, I'm pretty sure that the 43 million shares that we have available to use now uh, can get us through calendar 2021. I've just told you we're not going to use any of the 500 million shares this year. So anyone who's looking at the short term rather than the long term, they want to worry about that issue for now. Um, but we don't know what's coming next winter. Right. Uh, had any of you heard of COVID-19 at Thanksgiving weekend of 2019? I hadn't. Yeah. The only thing I heard about was the Spanish flu epidemic in 1919. And I looked at that as like an anachronism for uh, oh, yeah. like another millennia. Right. And like that could never happen again in a modern world. Well, what happens if the bubonic plague comes around next winter? What happens if dengue fever spreads all over the United States? I don't know what's going to happen, but I want to make sure that if there were to be a calamity, that this management team is armed with what we need to survive it. So if we needed to raise capital in 2022, because we're not going to use these shares in 2021, they'd be sitting there. If we needed, maybe we didn't need it in 2022. Maybe we need it in 2023 or 2026. But I'll tell you what I don't want to do. I don't want to be asking the shoulder. Gee, we need to help it up three, four months at the shoulder. But when you go through all the issues of doing elections, if we need to move on an, on an instant, we should have this optionality of all AMC shoulders. And I'm voting every single one of my shares in favor of this move. Um, and uh, so there are just a whole host of reasons why the shareholders should want us to have this flexibility and all this fear, uncertainty, and doubt that we're going to somehow dump these shares on the market in the next couple of weeks or couple of months, which might interfere with the investment thesis of some of your subscribers. I just told you, we just made a sacred pledge. <laughs> we're not going to do that. Adam, I've got to say, I uh, I am incredibly impressed once again with uh, your business experience and the way that you handle um, press and situations like this. Because in a single statement that you just said in this interview, you addressed all of the fear that people have. Because I'll be I'll be you know upfront with you. I, along with I think the majority of AMC holders, are in this for the long run. You know, <laughs> whatever happens in the next three months, maybe we take some profits and we get back in at the bottom. And we we I'm, I'll tell you this, I'm going to hold my stock and I'm going to continue to be you know a loyal investor. But there are those people, like you said, who are only worried about the three month or the six month time frame and. I mean, as a as a you know a statement that's coming out to the general public, you have to hold true your word, you know, as a company to that. And that wow, <laughs> I had like five or six questions that were gonna kind of get around exactly that question, which is incredible. Wow, I I'm really impressed. So here's the thing: uh, most of our shoulders have not yet voted on this proposition, right? So I encourage you all to vote in the affirmative. Uh, and if you voted no, which I happen to know that you did, Trey, because you told me you voted I'll no. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. It's it's not it's not too late for you to change your mind because even if you've already voted, you can change your vote all the way up to May 4th. Mm. Uh, and uh, again, if you voted no, I would encourage you to re-vote and vote yes. If you haven't voted yet, I would encourage you to vote yes. And I'm voting all my shares, yes. And again, I'm telling you why. Because you're arming your management with increased tools and resources that we can use in a good faith effort with the trust that we've already kind of established with you all for your benefit, for the benefit of increasing shareholder value. And your concerns that we might do anything in the short term with these 500 million shares, I just took them off the table. That's some incredible, wow. 
that's a lot of information to process. I'm trying really hard to stay composed and, and not be jumping off the walls hearing that because honestly, not just for myself, but it's going to ease so many people's minds, Adam. That's, that's really, that was a huge concern for, for the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I have one question regarding the vote, though. So if people don't decide to vote, they don't vote yes, they don't vote no. Um, I, I've seen some, you know, some readings saying that your brokerage firm may vote for you. Do you know what that process looks like? Are you able to speak on that at all or what that would look like if somebody did not cast their own vote? I can. Uh, some brokerage firms uh, will cast votes in the same percentages as those who did vote voted. Mm. But the brokerage firms that your subscribers tend to use right. often do not do that. And so if you do not vote, that is a no vote. Because in this case, on this matter of shareholders authorizing shares, we do not need a majority of the votes that are cast. We need a majority of the votes that are outstanding. Mm. So if it's a yes vote, obviously it's a yes vote. If it's a no vote, obviously it's a no vote. But if it's not a vote, Mm. then it's not a yes vote. So it essentially counts as a no vote. Right. So it's, uh, I encourage all AMC shareholders, take a position. Uh, if you think you this is a good idea for shareholders, you should vote yes. If you think this is a bad idea for shareholders, I think you're wrong, but that's your view, then you should vote no. But don't waste your vote by not voting. Because that will automatically be counted as a no vote. Okay, that's that's been a huge topic of discussion over the last couple of weeks is what that looks like in, in terms of, you know, if you don't vote, is that just an automatic yes? And you know, like you said, the majority of people haven't voted yet, which honestly is, you know, I, I think it's good to form an opinion, even if it's not right at the time. So this is, you know, my perspective as an investor, and I think where a lot of people are coming from is you make do with the information that you have at the time and you make a decision based on that. New information comes out, you retest your hypothesis and challenge your way of thinking and make a new decision. Now I'm not gonna disclose, I mean, I, I think I think this is pretty obvious what people are gonna how how, how people react to this, but um you, you gotta come in with an open mind and just be willing to have an opinion based on new information. You know, that's the most common sense way to uh, make a decision regarding an investment. So here's the new information that's out. Number one, I've given you four different examples right. of how we might use the money, not the money, the shares, for the benefit of shareholders. Uh, that may not be new information to the whole universe, but I think it's new information to a lot of your retail investors. Right. Second, I tried to clarify that just voting yes to authorize shares does not mean those shares get issued. Right, 100%. Third, I reminded everybody that in past history, the last time this was done, the company did not use a single one of those shares for three and a half years and did not use another single one of those shares for another three and a half years. Mm. So this is much more a long-term play. You know, I, uh, I did see something, one comment that, well, why are they, if, why are they asking for so many shares? Uh, if, if they had asked for 100 million shares, I would have voted yes, but they're asking for 500 million shares, they're going to vote no. Right. Well, why do we have so many shares? Because <clears throat> it costs a lot of money mm. to, to go get these shareholder elections done. Mm. So we might as well ask for a five to 10 year supply. Now, could we use all those shares on January 2 of 22? I guess we could. <laughs> would, it be, would it be smart to? No, it wouldn't be smart to. Right. Um, uh, and um, uh, so again, this new information is we've done this before. And you should not expect that all these shares are going to hit the market anytime soon. Then also the real new information of the day, of course, is uh, that we're not going to use a single one of these 500 million new shares in calendar 2021. If we need to use shares, we have 43 million shares that are sitting out there that we can use right now. 
Mm. Uh, 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 but uh, right now, caveated solely by the fact we still have to go to the SEC and do the appropriate filings, right? Which, of course, we would before we do anything. Um, but um, uh, we're not going to use any of these 500 million shares this year. Uh, and that puts us beyond this short term thinking that some of your retail investor friends are focused on at the moment. Dang. Do you, I, I got to give it to you. I got to give it to you, Adam. That's, that's a really incredible way to, to calm the masses because it's really important. A lot of, uh, you know, a stock, you know, its price matters um, depending on how the market reacts to things. It could be good news and sometimes people react terrible, which in, in this case, I'm, I don't even know if you anticipated the dilution, you know, prospect being reacted to in this way, but sometimes that's how things work. And that was a, that was a good, good, uh, good pitch. You threw a good pitch. Well, well, you well, thank you. But look, you said it right. It's fear and doubt. Right. I'm going to take out the uncertainty because I just gave you certainty. Right. Certainty is we're not going to use these shares in calendar 21. But the fear and doubt, um, you know, I, there were there were people speculating we were going to put all these 500 million shares out right away. What? I don't, I'm a shareholder myself. Yeah, right. Why would we do that? But, <laughs> you know, the, the other bit of new information may be that this management team that we've assembled at AMC is a pretty good team. Uh, and um, we've demonstrated that uh, we can navigate the capitalist system pretty well for AMC shareholders. Mm. Uh, and the fears and the, and the doubt surrounding would we flood the market with shares? That would not be a smart thing to do. And we tend not to, uh, we tend to want to only do smart things. That makes sense to me. And like, like you said, I think a lot of people forget that you're a shareholder and you want the stock price to go up and that everybody benefits if the stock price goes up. Um, you know, I, I kind of want to take a, a little swing here. There's just a couple more questions that I have for you. And it's before, go ahead. before we go to the next question, just to, we'll put a coda on this last yeah, awesome. discussion. I don't care whether you have eight shares or 80 shares or 800 shares or 8,000 shares or 80,000 shares. On this, on these proxy issues, vote your shares. Mm. Every share matters. We've all seen these political elections where in a country of 300 million people, like 500 votes are determining a presidential election or you know, 50 votes are, are choosing who's a senator in a state. I think, I think it was 300 was in Minnesota or something or other. Right. Um, uh, like every vote counts. So whether you're a big shareholder, a medium-sized shareholder, or a small shareholder, vote your shares. That's a, that's a good way to, to top that, that off. Every, every voice matters. And that's, that's been a big piece of, uh, you know, kind of what we talk about here in the community is how every single ape out there, every person holding stock contributes, you know, it's, uh, it's something that we take a lot of pride in. I think that's going to really hit home. Awesome. So, well, look, go ahead. I've said it before. I'll say it again. You guys own AMC. Right. It's just that simple. This is your company. Um, and that's why we're talking to you today. Hey, well, I'll say this every single time you say that. It means a lot to me. I appreciate it a lot. Um, so I kind of want to talk very briefly. I know there's there's limited amounts of things you can say about um, the short-term price action on a stock. And I'm not going to ask you anything about the stock price itself. But regarding the short squeeze. So in a recent 10K form that was filed with the SEC from AMC, uh, you guys referred in quotations to a short squeeze in you know which coordinated trading activity could cause a spike in the market price of a common stock for traders, right? Uh, you know, it's essentially the shorts covering their positions shoots the stock price up. So as you've acknowledged in you know recent interviews about the the Reddit rally phenomenon, this has led to the creation of, of our community and many more like it. Uh, these people, commonly known as you know the apes, as we've talked about throughout this interview, and as you know from the Reddit boards, um, are now shareholders, and many of them appear to be buying and holding AMC stock in anticipation of a potential short squeeze uh, and the potential profits that may accompany it, you know, as we kind of briefly touched on here, the short term, right? The three month, the six month. And then, you know, I kind of wanted to ask you, you know, hypothetically what the outcome, um, you know, of such an event would be for the long term stock. Is this going to hurt the company in any way? And then, you know, I don't even have to ask my second piece, but if, if, if you had any words to say in regards to this short term phenomenon where 
Short positions are doubling down on the stock, even though fundamentally speaking, you guys are looking better every single month, every single year. Um, you know, what would you say to those guys in, in, in that situation that's unfolding right now? Well, Trey, I, look, I admire the degree to which your, uh, the people in your community are paying attention to our stock. Uh, uh, I know there's a, a tremendous amount of time and devotion to technical trading, uh, uh, statistics, and trends. Uh, I've run companies now for 28 years. Uh, and I've made it a habit not to talk too much right. publicly, anyway, publicly, anyway, <laughs> about the uh, the nuances of the stock trading. Um, uh, my focus is better directed on the long-term prospects of the company, the short-term problems and opportunities that we need to overcome or capitalize on, the medium-term problems and opportunities we need to solve or benefit from, the long-term problems and opportunities. And so again, I, I think it's more appropriate for the CEO of a public company like AMC to be talking about the situation the company finds itself in, mm. getting our way through the pandemic, rather than commenting publicly on the intricacies of share price movement and motivations of indiv individual shareholders. Uh, I, I actually think that's better left to people like you and analysts and retail investors themselves where people are free to make their own decisions right. unencumbered by whatever I think. Okay. So that, that makes total sense. And you know, you, you don't know until you ask, but if you could say something specifically to, let's say the analysts who gave it a one cent price target or the hedge funds that are betting against your company, can you say something about that? What would you tell them? Can you, can you answer that question by any chance? Sure. Sure. Um, in the same month, and it might have actually, it might have crossed the month in the same four week span. Let's put it that way. Right. Somebody put out a, do, a one penny price target. An analyst put out a one penny price target, and a different analyst put out a thirteen dollar price target. I sure hope that the guy who put out the thirteen dollar price target is more correct than the person who put out the one penny right uh, price target. Uh, and I guess if I thought the one penny guy was accurate, I might be selling stock and I'm not selling stock. Or I might choose to run a different company, mm. but I'm not going to choose to run a different company. I'm a bull about AMC's future long-term prospects. I believe that AMC had a very proud first 100 years in business. Uh, and I'd like to think we're in a very proud second 100 year in years in business. And, you know, people have been writing off the movie theater industry forever. Radio was going to put movies out of business. TV was going to put movies out of business. VCRs was going to put <laughs> movies out of business. DVDs were going to put movie theaters out of business. Streaming was going to put movie theaters out of business. I'm going to make you one prediction and one prediction only. 50 years from now, people will be saying about the next thing that's going to put movie theaters out of us. <laughs> right. And yet we're resilient and we're still here. Uh, why? Because there's something magical about going to a theater, escaping from the outside world. No cell phones, no talking, just you engrossed looking at that giant screen with that big roaring sound system in that big plush comfortable seat. Uh, can you watch a movie on your telephone? Yeah, I guess you can. Can you watch it on your iPad? Yeah, you can. Is it better on a 65 foot screen? You bet it is. And not only that, you don't do it alone. Mm. When you go to a theater, and you watch a movie in a theater, and it's a comedy, and there are 
80 people around you laughing hysterically. You laugh harder. Right. If it's a horror movie and somebody starts shrieking at the important moment, you shriek too. If it's a drama, if it's a tearjerker and there's not a dry eye in the house, like that's a saying. There's not a dry eye in the house. You'll be crying too. Right. And watching it at home, it just doesn't have the same impact. In addition to that, going to a movie theater is a cheap date. You know, depending upon what city you live in, yes, you could pay $24 to go see a movie in an IMAX or Dolby Cinema Auditorium in Manhattan. But the average movie ticket in the United States is around 10 bucks. Mm. Where can you go for 10, excuse me, where can you go for 10 bucks and have two, three hours of great entertainment other than a movie theater? I can't think of it. How often, right? How, like, I like going to a concert. It's expensive. I like going to a sporting event. It's expensive. Going to a movie, it's 10 bucks in round numbers. Can be more, can be less. Um, and and that assumes, by the way, that you don't buy a very reasonably priced popcorn and soda. But that's <laughs> costs, costs a little more if you buy a popcorn and a Coke. But, um, but look, if this pandemic has taught us anything, we talked about conventional wisdom well, a little while ago. A couple of years ago, all the conventional wisdom was, oh, you know, streaming is going to put movie theaters out of business because people want to stream, people want to stream. Okay, yeah, people stream. Yeah. But you know what they also want to do? They want to get out of their houses. They want to get out of their apartments. Especially now. I mean, if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's people are so ready to get out and about. I used to joke that if I could spend three hours, back this is like last June, like if I could spend three hours in a hardware store, that would be like a thrilling afternoon. <laughs> like anything to get out of my house. Right. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why you see impatience all around the United States to get some back to some semblance of normal living again. And go into the movies, right? go into the movies. That is something that that is the second most common out of home experience in the United States pre pandemic, second only to going out to eat a meal at a restaurant. How many people went to a movie theater in the U.S.? Well, AMC sold 250 million tickets. The industry sold a billion tickets in the United States in 2019. That's every man, woman, <laughs> and baby in the country. And man, woman, child, and baby go to a movie theater three times a year. Wow. And, um, and if you take, like, I'm a big, I'm a sports, I'm a movie buff, I'm a sports buff. Right. Like, we know, like, everybody loves football, right? If you take the entire attendance of every NFL game all season long, every team in the NFL, and baseball, it's America's pastime, just for sport, let's throw that in. Right. All 162 games in a normal pre-pandemic season, all the teams – all season long, all the cities, throw that in, add in the entire attendance of every team in the NHL, add in the entire attendance of every team in the NBA. Hey, throw in Major League Soccer while you're at it. You take the entire <laughs> ticket counts sold in all professional sports. M movie theater tickets were sold seven times as much of all professional sports tickets combined. Wow. People go to movie theaters. It's why AMC had revenues of five and a half billion dollars prior to the pandemic. And I'm, as I said, I think our best days are still ahead of us. That's a great way to uh, to answer that question, Adam. That's man, that gets me really excited. You, you've got a good way. Of so, words. but I'm going to throw in one. I'm going to throw in one more though. Go ahead. So you said, what do I say to those people who are betting against us? Hundred percent. I'm going to say three simple things. I don't think it's a good idea to bet against movie theaters. 
And I certainly don't think it's a good idea to get bet against AMC. And I'd like to think it's not a good idea to bet against Adam Aaron either. Oof. I think uh, I, that's a that's a good silverback uh, silverback thing to say, man. That that gets me excited. That's <laughs> I wouldn't bet against you either with your with your history. I mean, honestly, you've got a great background in in all the different positions you've worked and your experience in and bringing companies from the ground up, from the the bottom, the the lowest valleys in their revenues and their prospects for the future. And I I definitely wouldn't either, which is why I'm long on the company. I'll say that right now. I think it's the smarter investment. Adam, there is one uh, small thing that I kind of wanted to to bring to your attention. It's it's a really cool opportunity that you know a lot of the retail investors have put together. Is this project, and it's called the Apes Together Strong documentary. I don't know if you were aware of this before, uh, you know, chatting right now, but this is uh, something that two guys kind of came up with the idea with. It's Finley and Quinn Henry Mulligan, the the Mulligan brothers, and they're a pair of filmmaking guys from Portland, Oregon, and they're throwing together this documentary that's going to be capturing the story of AMC itself, the community, the whole process of how we've all come to love this stock and this company. And the you know the the people that are brought together essentially, and I'm I'm very blessed and, and grateful to they they reached out to me to be an ex- executive producer working on that with them. But um, they intend to create that film you know within our community using the resources that we have as people uh, to to give a message from the apes for the apes for the people you know to tell a story of AMC stock and. It, it seems pretty promising, and I'm, I'm very excited to be a part of this. And I, I kind of want to bring this to your attention. You know, I think it's a, a really cool opportunity, and I, I, we're going to keep you up to date on the progress of that. I'm going to see if I can get you, you know, a, a copy when it's all said and done. And hey, maybe you'll even consider airing this in uh, an AMC theater near you someday. You know, uh, I just think it's a really cool opportunity. I, I wanted to, to honestly brag about the community here. I think it's a really cool thing. Well, thanks for letting me know, um, and we'll see if there's any way we can properly cooperate with the uh, documentary makers. Awesome. Uh, whether that whether that's in the preparation of the content or the showing of the content. Um, but I, I think you know this because like we keep seeing these memes every day that come out on AMC. <laughs> right. Uh, and I was on I was giving a, a major media interview the other day. Um, and we were talking about the success of the Kong Godzilla movie. Mm. And the interviewer was going on and on and on and on about how much she really liked Godzilla. Right. And I believe my direct quote was, I prefer apes to lizards myself. I remember so hearing that. That's good. Oh, it, it's, it's hard to root against, uh, against the apes. Kong is a pretty cool, pretty cool dude. <laughs> but having said that, I want to, I, I want to say something that's really important. Okay. Definitely. Um, I'm not here today because of the Reddit rally or the Robin Hood effect or whatever, uh, or any of the stock trading since January. That's that admittedly has been quite volatile. Um, I'm here for one reason and one reason only. The people who subscribe to your channel, a lot of them own AMC stock. Right. And it's very important for a company and a management team and a CEO to talk to his or her or their shareholders. And, and I just have an enormous appreciation to the shareholders of our company. It's your company and I work for you. Uh, And that's why I'm here. Uh, And the rest of all those issues, they're interesting phenomena that are going on, but they're not what attracted me to uh, Trace Trace. What attracted me here is the fact that you're talking to the owners of my company and I want the owners, I want to be able to talk to the owners of my company. And I want the owners of my company to know that I'm listening to them as well. So some of the things that we've addressed in this very discussion today uh, are because we learned what was on the minds of your community. And we reacted accordingly. Because we wanted to get the correct information out there and not let misinformation govern. 
That's perfect. And I, honestly, I got to say it again. I said this earlier. Every single time that you say that you you, you, you uh, chose to come here, I have to say I'm thankful and I'm humbled. But you're 100% correct. And it's it's long-term shareholders. We own the company. you know. And a lot of people take pride in that. I take pride in that. And that's why I'm so passionate about talking about it. I mean, I get up in the morning every day at 3 a.m., excited to start doing my research and digging into the company and make my videos and talk to talk to the community and to have your support i think is going to mean a lot to a lot of people well thank you and my pleasure to be with you all today awesome i've, I've just got to say you know one last thing it's it's an absolute honor that we were able to have you here and i'm going to quote you here we're going to fight them on the beaches i remember you said that in in one of your interviews and uh you know, we're, we're really proud people. We're proud apes. We're proud to own this stock. A lot of us have been, I, I have a lot of, it's like going to the candy store. I love going to the movies. Uh, I had my first kiss in a movie theater. I've seen Kong versus Godzilla five times. Now I bought an extra large popcorn and Diet Coke every time I've gone. And um, we take a lot of pride. So as the CEO of the company, I want to be able to pass along the message from the community here that we're with you. We're, we're with the company and we really want to see it succeed because we have sentimental value and care, uh, you know, for the company and what it's going to bring for the future. So, uh, so maybe this is a nice way to end. Ready? Right. Uh, based on our understanding uh, from Hollywood Studios, a lot of big movies are going to be coming out: uh, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Uh, I'm looking forward not only to you being retail investors at AMC, but love for you to be retail customers of AMC too. And, and I hope that when you go to our theaters, you have a great time, that you uh, enjoy seeing movies the way movies are supposed to be seen on the big screen with big sound in our comfortable big seats. I'll tell you what, I'll definitely be one of those retail customers and I always will be. I look forward to it. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time, Adam. It's been an absolute honor. I'm going to call this off. Thank you to everybody that watched this interview. Uh, if you want to hit the like button, you know, appreciate Adam coming on here and consider subscribing if you like to see more stuff like this. That'd be absolutely awesome. Peace out, my fellow friends, family, Anchor Ruler Gang, and peace.